Hello everybody, welcome back to Prospects Providence. And today we have a very special video coming at you. And we're going to be going over my overall reactions to the 2021 MLB Draft. Now before we get into this video, we have to write out, lay down some ground rules. This is not your typical draft video where I would go through the, the class, grade them on, on picks, give them grades. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. Mainly because I don't give out grades because I think, well number one, I think it's kind of silly to grade a draft class when most of the time in baseball you have to wait four to five years until you can fully grade it because baseball players just take much longer to develop. But also, um, I'm doing this because I think this is a little bit of a different way to look at the draft. Where um, I'm commenting on picks that actually happened, but I'm also commenting mainly on the strategy that the teams used. I'm also not grading the strategy that these teams used. I'm just giving you my overall reaction to what the team did. So without further ado, we're going to get right, hop right into this video and we're going to be starting off with the NL East. Okay, starting it off in the NL East, we have to talk about the elephant in, in the room, and that would be the Pittsburgh Pirates. For what they were able to pull off in this draft, I absolutely love what they did here, ladies and gentlemen. Getting, getting possi possibly the most talent in the draft in one class. Guys, this was a master class and how to work the MLB draft. They start off their, their draft with picking Henry Davis, which, you know, was a pick I thought was totally under slot, but it allowed them to get money from basically their, their pool and spend it on other picks. Getting Anthony Salamanto in the, in the second round, getting a player like Lonnie White later in the supplemental round, and then getting Bubba Chandler in the third. That right there, ladies and gentlemen, is three first-rounders that I had in my mock draft. Getting them in this draft was absolutely insane value. The Pittsburgh Pirates absolutely killed this draft. And while they definitely had to take a little bit of money savers later, later on in the draft, at the end of the day, you're getting so much value at the top that it's fine to take a money savers down at the bottom. I don't really care about the picks that happened down at the bottom in the 9th, 10th, 11th round. You know, they could all be good players. I'm saying I don't care about the players. I'm saying I don't really care about... At this point, it's it's a luxury if you get anything out of those picks because the first three, the first couple of picks were so good. Pirates absolutely dominated this draft. Ben Charrington absolutely flexed on, on the MLB and he put on a show and an absolute masterclass on how to dominate the MLB draft. All right, so we'll move on to the next team we'll talk about, and that's going to be the Chicago Cubs. And I thought they had a okay draft. Like, obviously I'm not giving grades, but, you know, I wasn't a really big fan of their first pick. Um, that was Jordan Wicks. You know, I'm just not that high on Jordan Wicks, mainly because I'm not really sure what his future value or future role of a, of of the team is going to be. To me, he sort of does look like a sort of a back-end starter with a very, very, very good changeup, but doesn't really throw hard, sits 91-93. Obviously, that's, that's not the most important thing, but I think the fastball in terms of movement, in terms of spin rate, is just, it, it's, it's very below average. He doesn't really have a second pitch. But, man, that changeup is just so wicked. And, you know, maybe this this was a bit of a money saver. Maybe they, they do view him as kind of a back-end starter. Maybe that's kind of like what they want. But to me, I, I don't know, man. There was just so many, so much better talent on the board where they picked. They didn't have that, they didn't have that low of a pick. They picked at 21. And I, I, I just thought that with this kind of, with a 20, with a... Barely a top 20 pick, but still a first round pick. You know, I still feel like that, like this type of player, I, I, I don't know if you can take him in the first round, but they they do spread the money out a little bit, getting um, in the second round, James Triantos from James Madison High School in Virginia. He's a prep shortstop, 
he was announced. Apparently, he was he was announced as a third baseman when he when he got drafted by the team. He's fine. I think he's okay. He doesn't really do anything truly outstanding, but he looks like a he looks like a bat, a, a really good bat bat first infielder. Um, but honestly, I thought the Cubs kind of had a below average draft. I didn't know what they really did what they could have done with, with the picks that they had. They used another one of their third round picks on a left-handed pitcher in Drew Gary, another um, high schooler from IMG Academy. Just not really what you really want at that point. And then in the fourth round, you do get Christian Franklin, a player that I actually saw getting some two-round hype. I was actually correct on this. Christian Franklin, I was not very high on. I thought the strikeouts were really concerning at Arkansas. I saw, like, the... I'm just not not fan... I'm not a fan of these type of prospects that are smaller, have to... that They have raw power, but sometimes they can have trouble getting to it. And these very long swings. Obviously, tremendous athlete. And at the fourth round, you take a, a flyer on this, absolutely. So that was a decent pick. Overall, you know, like, they had a lot of picks like that that were fine to decent to below average. They were just kind of like, if I was giving grades, Bs, 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 all, all across the board... Not really much to really comment there from the Cubs. Just a lot of Bs. So, alright. So, the next team we're going to be talking about will be the St. Louis Cardinals. And this team, I thought, had a pretty questionable first pick. But the rest of the draft was just nails. Um, let's talk about that first pick here. Um, Michael McGravy, at a, Michael McGravy definitely was... Looking back at it now, definitely was a money saver. Just, I think that's the best way I can put it. You know, he looks okay. He has good control. He doesn't have the best stuff in the world. Kind of a, did kind of give me Shane Bieber vibes a little bit. But, in terms of just what he brings, I think he could be a back end to middle of the rotation starter. Another one of these guys... But I think he does have really solid control. And, you know, he signed for 2.75 mil, which is actually a million less than the slot value is. So this was clearly an under slot sign. Did I think McGravy was a top 20 pick? No, I, I don't even think I had him in the... I think I might have had him in the, in the late first round of my mock. But obviously with this next pick, you take Michael McGravy because you get Mr. Joshua Baez... In the second round, hello Cardinals! Wow, I mean, just what a pick! This might have been one of the best draft picks in this whole entire draft. If the Pirates didn't didn't dominate this draft the way they did, I would have totally given the Cardinals the best draft in the division. Just what a good pick Joshua Baez is. Yes, they do have to spend a lot of money to get him, but man, is he projectable! Big time power. Really good arm in the outfield. Just an absolute athletic freak. He yeah, he's not the fastest. Yeah, his hit tool is a little bit under is a little is a little bit underdeveloped. He's raw. He's very raw. But the Cardinals have a pretty decent track. The Cardinals have gained their trust from me of developing these the, the these high school athletic freaks because Jordan Walker is doing so well in the minors right now. And because Jordan Walker is doing very good, kind of gives me like the vibes that like, okay, maybe they know how to how to develop these 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 high scores. And Joshua Baez definitely is screaming for someone to develop him, because th the potential with this pick is you could be getting a potential three to four win outfielder and a guy who could potentially hit forty plus home runs a year. This is the absolute. That's the potential you could be getting. Now, could he bust? Absolutely, all prospects have that have could all bust, you know. But I think that for where they were, I thought that they just killed it. From I, I thought that that pick just was so good, and it really didn't matter what they did with their with their next couple of picks, because honestly, I thought that that they just did so well with with McGravy and um getting getting McGravy, who's a solid. Player a little bit under, a little bit under slot. Yes, he wasn't worth the 14th overall pick, but when you pair him up with with Baez, 
that's when, like, you know, it's like, this is a really good class. And they had some underrated picks throughout the draft as well. Um, not much, but honestly, it's like, not much really... Not much really else to truly comment over. Just really, really, really solid picks from um, the Cardinal side of things. Cardinal side of things here. You know, you get, you do get a lot of really solid players later on. And I think the draft strategy of doing what they did, where they invest into what they know and what they feel could be a back-end starter for them, getting him immediately, then getting Joshua Baez later. That's such a good draft strategy. You spend money, you spend money a little bit early. You don't spend you don't spend the most money early on. You get your guy, and then you get your guy later. I love the strategy. They had some pretty decent picks later on. But I thought the strategy that they that they took was really fun. I thought the Cardinals had a really impressive draft. So the next team we're going to be talking about here is the Cincinnati Reds. And honestly, they had a really impressive draft too. We'll start out with their first pick and they get Matt McLean. I am as, as a top 20 player. I thought the value of this pick was very, very, very good. Very solid shortstop here. Will he ever be a true superstar? Probably not. But for number 17 overall, I thought that this was a very good pick. Good slot value, right that perfect sweet spot. I had him going, I actually had him going to the Cardinals in my mock draft. So this is, and they picked 15. And, and they picked 14 or 15. So like, this was perfect value. I had him as a mid first round talent. You get him in the mid first round. It's after what they did that really is impressive though. You get, so, they, so they have the first supplemental pick in the draft. And they select Jay Allen, one of my guys. Yes, yes, yes. I love it, Cincinnati. I love it. I love this pick. Jay Allen was one of the most slept on players in this draft. I thought he was misscouted. He, the, the power is probably going to come in. He's going to come in. He's added the power. He's a very good athlete. He's freaky athletic. Good runner. Good fielder in the outfield. This was is a very, very solid pick for... For the Cardinal, for the Reds, and then we move on to their next pick. They actually had 30 and 35, so they had a lot of room to wiggle here in the first round. And they selected Matt Nelson out of Florida State. You know, Matt Nelson was a very, very, very late riser for me. I didn't honestly know what to think of him. He didn't really. Pr he produced a decent amount at Florida State. But this was really his first true breakout year. Had a lot of home runs. I think he hit like 20 home runs this year. Big time power. Really under a, a decent fielder. Not the best arm. Decent glove. You know, I didn't really know where to rank him. I gave him a, a mid-second round grade. So it, it wasn't the best pick in the world. But, you know, I thought it was a solid pick. But when you, when you add all this up with Matt McClain, Jay Allen, and, and Matt Nelson, two players... Three players I feel really good about working out. This is where the draft gets. Gets really good. And and they continue to draft getting guys like in like in, in the second round, Andrew Abbott, Jose Torres from a sh they get Jose Torres in the third round from NC State. A lot of very a lot of production. They get production. They get solid players. And they get a lot. A lot of, of of solid future value for me. I thought the Cardinal. I thought the Reds absolutely killed this draft. You know, did they add the most talent in the world? Probably not. But I thought for what they were able to do, they got a lot of they got a lot of solid above average talent into this system. And I think that's really what the the whole entire point of the. MLB draft is is to add solid value to the system. This is what's needed in in baseball right now. So, all right. So for the last team here, we're gonna be going 
on to the Milwaukee Brewers and with this with this draft class, I think that they took kind of a similar strategy where like I think they wanted to to kind of expand their floor of their farm system and kind of just and kind of just take what they thought were the best players available. And it started off with kind of a below average pick in my opinion, and that's gonna be Sal Freelick. Just you know, fifteenth overall. No, I had him in the in in the top of my in the top in the top top fifteen of my mock draft, but honestly, you know, the the flaws of Sal Freelick are there. He will not hit for that much power. He's probably going to get on base a decent amount. He's going to make a lot of decent contact. He'll probably hit for a high average. He'll be a good defender in either in center and an outfield spot, but he'll be a really good base runner. But, like, just how much value can you offer when you're maybe hitting 10 home runs a year and your slugging percentage is not going to be that high? You're going to really have to go on base. You're going to really have to run the base as well. Again, if you do not hit for power, how valuable can this pick be? And I think Freelick will be a solid player for the Brewers. I think he can get to the majors pretty quickly. But, I don't know, man. This, this pick... I just like with, with with Garrett Mitchell already in the farm system, with the Brewers um all outfield kind of already crowded as it is. I I just I, I don't know. Maybe like do they want to move him to second base? Maybe you do want to move him to, to to the dirt, but I don't know. You know he's he's decent. South really is a good player. I'm not saying he's bad, but. You're gonna really have to prove that you can be a a really above average player without hitting for power. And there are players in the MLB who do this. Guys like uh, David Fletcher and Nick Madrigal and and some and some other players who do offer a lot of value to a team that don't hit for elite power. And maybe Sal Freelick will be like that. And then, and then they kind of just spread their money out, getting guys like Tyler Black at a right state. He's an advanced college hitter, you know, good, decent fielder at second base. And then, and then, like as we go on, you know, getting just a lot of solid players. I will comment on round three, Alex Benayas. This was a guy that I thought had first round hype going into the year. Had a miserable year year at Louisville. Really struggled with injuries again. And if he can really find it, I think he can become the player I thought he once was. But, you know, I, I think they really, they wanted to get players who could move to the to the majors quickly. And I really think there is value to that. I think there is total value in a player that can move quickly. And I think they took a lot of players who aren't going to take a lot of time developing. Guys like Russell Smith, Alex, Alex Benea, Alex Benayas, guys like, guys like, like, um, what was his name, uh, Tyler Black, Sal Freelick, a lot of really high impact college players at the top of their draft, I love, I, I like when teams kind of buy into the college players, they buy into what the, the value of the, of the class is, this class had a lot of f floor in its, in its college players, and they wanted to get floor. And that's what they got. They got a floor for this draft. And I thought I thought they they you know they didn't really go over slot for a lot of their picks. They kind of just they're probably just gonna go like at slot value for a lot of their picks, but only because they are college players. So with that, we're gonna finish up the NL Central and we're gonna be heading to the NL East next. Alright, and we're gonna start off our NL East review of of the draft. And we're going to start off with the Miami Marlins. And they got potentially the steal of, of the draft. And they got Khalil Watson, a, a top 10 player for me. And you get him at 16? Are you kidding me, Marlins? Now, Watson was a, was a player that apparently had some apparent off the field issues some teams obviously 
you know, thought that thought that his ability to recognize off-speed pitch pitches probably wasn't the greatest. He is smaller. He does have a very large swing. There are question marks whether or not his bat will play at the big league level or not. The bat is a question mark. But I think that with the athleticism, the speed, the fielding at shortstop, maybe he does fit better at second base. But to me, I actually thought of a comp, and it's actually his Marlins teammate, and that's Jazz Chisholm. I think Jazz Chisholm could be a pretty okay comp to um, Khalil Watson. But obviously with Khalil Watson, he's going to be expensive. And the Marlins don't have all the money in the world, so you kind of have to blow your money on Watson. But I still feel like they got a lot of value and with their compensation pick they got Joe Mack high school catcher from New Jersey Joe Mack was a player I thought was good I had him as like a mid second round player they took him in the in the compensation round so the value wasn't completely awful but you know with Joe Mack and Wake and uh, Khalil Watson obviously those players are gonna be expensive so you go big time on the first two picks then you kind of save money later on taking a lot of college hitters taking Cody Morissette Morissette decent pick in the second round taking you know a guy like in the fourth round Tanner Allen from Mississippi State taking South Carolina's Brady Allen taking Alabama Sam Prater I mean just taking a lot of a lot of college players, but only because you you kind of have to save money. I thought the Marlins did a decent, did a really nice job with their draft. And we're going to be moving on to the Washington Nationals. And wow, they got Brady House. A player I had as a top five pick. I had him as a top, as top six talent in my board. And you get him at 11. Great pick, Washington Nationals. But... Kind of again, like, while the first pick is good, the other picks just kind of were, were I can really describe them as money savers. And I think that, like, that's one of the probably the best way I can describe, I can describe these, some of these other picks for the, for the Nationals. But I think the the thing is is that when you have when you have that when you have that that first pick when you have that first pick of Brady a Brady House when you have that first pick of Brady House it's just It's it, it's it, it just adds so much value to your system. The Nationals really needed some upside here here with these with these picks, but you know, but but you do spend big time on, in the second round on Trini on on Dalen um Dalen Lyle. He's probably gonna sign for about slot value, maybe a little bit over in the second round. You know, Dalen Lyle was a player that I didn't really know what to think about. Really good athlete. But you get him in the second round, I think it's fine. And then from there on out, guys like Braden, um, B boys, Braden Boys set, outfielder from Arizona, Dustin Sinus from Texas A&M, TJ White. Like I, so a lot of these guys are, will, will be money will be money savers. A lot of college players, only because I think Brady House is probably going to be pretty damn expensive. So. You know, Nationals, I really liked what they did. You get a really good player, a really, really good player in the in your first pick. And then, and then you just add a bunch of value. I love when teams do that. And we're going to be moving on to our next team, which is going to be the New York Mets. And the Mets in the top 10 getting actually a pick that I predicted, which would be Kumar Rocker in the as a top 10 pick. Some people said that this was to steal the draft. I thought it was a really fine pick. Obviously, I wasn't the highest on Kumar Rocker. You guys know that I think that Kumar is... I think Kumar is 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 a good pitcher. But obviously, I didn't think he was a player that, like, you really... You thought that he should have gone top ten. He should have gone easy top five. The best player in this draft. 
I think his stock definitely dropped, but I think getting him the top 10 was solid. Um, he immediately signs for around $6 million. And then, and then like, you move down the draft, getting Calvin Ziegler, a pitcher from a... A pitcher from... from A high school pitcher. Dominic Harrell, another high school pitcher. So, so those high school pitchers are probably going to spend a lot of money. On them, along with Rocker. So, and then for the rest of the draft, they kind of just have money savers. So, Mets, again, had a very nice draft. The theme here you're seeing is that the is that teams are not having bad drafts. I don't think there was a really terrible draft in this in this whole entire in this whole entire um class. I really don't think that like there was one team who just did nothing right. Now there's a team I can disagree with we'll we'll get to, but I don't even think they really had that terrible of a class. But I'm talking at this point. We're gonna move on to the Atlanta Braves and with their first pick they selected, they once again went, they once again went with a lot of college players, they went with a lot of college, they got a couple of, they got a couple of really solid players, we'll start off with their first pick in Ryan Cusack, a player that honestly I'm not high on at all, I'm, I'm just not high on Ryan Cusack, honestly I thought it was probably one of the biggest reaches, reach, reaches in the draft. But I think the class itself kind of saved the Cusack pick. I think they feel like that, like they can kind of develop his delivery more, develop his pitches better. Um, honestly, but like what we see from the Braves is that they want they want um, developed. Uh, they kind of want projectable college arms, like guys like Jared Schuster in last year's draft. Guys who like probably aren't the most developed right now, but could develop into something very, very good. I think that the strategy definitely can work. Um, obviously, with like guys like Spencer Schwellenblock out of Nebraska, uh, Schwellenblock was definitely a fantastic pick. Had him as a mid-second rounder. You get him mid to late second round. Perfect value. Love the pick. Really good player. Really solid pitcher. You get a couple of other high schoolers. You get a couple other really solid high schoolers down the board. With guys like Dylan Dode, projectable arm for them. Cal Col Colney out of Texas Tech in the fourth is a is a decent pick. Luca Luke Waddle out of shortstop out of Tech Georgia Tech. You know, just a lot of really solid players here for the for the Braves. And I thought that like their their strategy of taking college first, kind of spraying the money out. I think that 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 strategy really can work. But now we're gonna move on to our last team here in the NL East selection of this video and we're going to be moving on to the Philadelphia Phillies who who I thought had a I thought kind of I like their sort of strategy of getting again another projectable arm in the first and then kind of spreading the money out as the draft went along um Andrew Painter is a pitcher that I did not have in my top 15 I had him a little bit lower I thought this was a complete project pick for the Phillies I'm a little bit worried for Painter because um, Phillies haven't had the best luck of developing pitching. And I think Andrew Painter is kind of a pitcher that sort of needs to be developed. He's kind of like screaming for development, but I think he's a solid pitcher. Again, the pick is a little, little bit of a reach. I would, a little bit of a reach on my board. I have, him, I have him as... I saw him as a top 20 player, so you're still getting a top 20 player in Painter. But honestly, I think that like... With, like, the Phillies kind of struggle of developing pitching, you know, we'll see how that works out. And then you get another, in the second round, you get Ethan Wilson, another, a, a, a college hitter, really solid college hitter. A guy that I really thought that could get some first round buzz coming into the year. Obviously, just did not perform well. Could not really perform against top competition when he got the chance. Obviously, he's not always getting a chance to reform. Here comes his not always... Obviously not getting a chance to always perform with, um, obviously playing at South Alabama. But, you know, I didn't really think he was, yeah, I think he was definitely worthy of the pick. Just, I think, very solid outfielder for them. And as you go on the board, you get a lot of other solid players. Again, I like the strategy of kind of, I will give them credit for aiming high. The Phillies, 
in these last couple drafts have not been afraid to aim high, aim with the ceiling, you know, shoot for the stars with their picks and kind of develop these pitchers. But until they can really fix their pitching development, I'm not sure how it's it's gonna go. But I'm I'm hopefully for Andrew Panther's sake, I think hopefully this pick will hopefully work out. But honestly, I thought the Phillies had a decent draft. You know, nothing truly groundbreaking happened here, but I thought that they, they added a decent amount of talent to a farm system that is dreadful right now and really, really, really needs it. Alright, so we're gonna be moving on to the NL West. Uh, version of this video and we'll start off with the LA Dodgers um, honestly I thought the Dodgers did decently well in this draft they they did something I kind of like and they took a lot of pitchers early on that are just pure development just let's throw them to the Dodgers development system which has been one of the best in, in, in baseball for a couple years now and let's just develop them and see what the and let's see what they can do. And it started with not only Maddox Burns, but also Peter Hubeck. And these are both um high school pitchers that are projectable arms that, that do project that that definitely do project and potentially have a rotation cha chance to be in a rotation one day. And I think that's really what it was about. Just getting these two pitchers, projectable arms, getting them into the Dodgers system. Let's see how it works out. And then getting a bunch of depth later on. I thought the Dodgers did a really nice job. And we're going to move on to the Colorado Rockies, what they did with this draft. And if I really had to name a draft that really irked me... Irked me the most, it would probably be... The either the Rockies or another team. It's not because it was a terrible draft, but like uh, some of their other moves kind of confused me. And Benny Montgomery was the first pick, and I said this was probably going to happen, but I I said it as a under slot pick to go above slot later with some other picks. But they but they didn't really do that though. Like they get a player. Like, obviously, I love Benny Montgomery. I think he was a top 15 talent. And I think that he's insanely athletic. He's a, he's a great runner. And he's a he's got a really good back. Obviously, I love Benny Montgomery. But then you spend your second round pick on Jaden Hill. Like, a, a sinker baller? Like, who who had no production at, at LSU? Like, yeah, Jaden Hill was really hyped up to begin the season. But there's a reason why he fell so far. I just, I'm not that big of a Jaden Hill fan. And then getting like a pitcher like Joe Rock out of Ohio and, and, and like McCade Brown, Hunter Goodman, it's just like, ugh, it's just it's it, it's 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 average. Like that's what I feel like with this with this Rockies draft is that I feel like it's a lot of average without a lot of upside. I think Benny Montgomery is the upside pick. The issue is that there weren't any other upside picks in this draft. You literally are, are drafting Jaden Hill out of a couple of innings he threw in LSU in the second round. Like, I knew Jaden Hill was going to go much, much higher than I had him. I had a third, fourth round grade on Jaden Hill. Mainly because I think the stuff is good. I think he does have decent stuff. But, like, he just can't stay healthy and his production in LSU just wasn't there. I think he really had his most success when he was coming out the bullpen, which I think is might be his 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 role going forward is, is a reliever. But overall, I thought the Rockies didn't have a bad draft. They just did some things that kind of confused me, which did don't I don't know. Rockies are, are a little bit of confusing, aren't they? So we'll move on now to the San Francisco Giants. And they took and then I thought they had a really nice draft as well. Again, taking a lot of taking a lot of upside with with these picks. And with these upside picks, we're also going to be getting a lot of really solid players. And it started with number 14 overall with Will Bednar in Mississippi State. A little overdrafted a little in my opinion, but I thought that like the the strategy here was, was really good at getting a productive, a, a solid starting pitcher. Then, like, it went and went on with, like, a guy like a Matt, Matt, 
uh, with a with a Matt McCloskey, just a guy that like was so projectable. I had him as a early second round pick. What a great pick by the by the by the Giants. I love Matt. I love Matt. I love Matt McCloskey. Like he's so good. McCloskey is so good. But like his control is not really there yet. But the Giants have a very good pitching farm system, and they're very good at developing pitching. So I could definitely see McCloskey and Bednar both really working out. And the guys like like and then you kind of continue with Mason Black and Eric Silva. Like add as much good solid pitching as possible, whether it be from the college ranks or the high school ranks. That was the Giants' plan here. I love the Giants' plan of just. Spending as many picks on pitching as possible. Pitching is very valuable in baseball right now. And I think the Giants definitely want to want to continue that trend. So Giants had a really good draft. Moving on now to San Diego Padres. Padres I thought had a really solid draft. I thought that with their with couple with a couple of their picks, you do you do get a lot of solid production out of them. Jackson Merrill started off their draft for them. High school Shortstop, really, really, really productive, really good player. A bit under, I think he might have signed for a bit under slot too, which is always important to mention. Jackson Miro is really solid, but the pick I want to talk about the most is um, James Wood, outfielder from IMG Academy. Um, James Wood is a very, very weird player. He's either going to really figure out how to hit, or he's going to absolutely tank. I don't really know which one of the James Wood you're going to be able to get. But I thought overall uh, the Padres draft was good. They invested heavily in high schoolers, which which is fine. You also get a guy like a Robert Gaster, Gaster in, in the comp round. Just really very, very talented, pretty talented pitcher from, from Houston. Robert Gaster was one of my favorite, was one of the most underrated picks in this whole entire draft. So the Padres did very good getting you get Merrill in the first, you get Wood in the second, you get Gaster Gaster in the in the, in the comp round 71. I thought the Padres did a very nice job with their draft, getting a lot of good talent. And then we're gonna be moving on to our last team of this video, of this NL edition, and that's gonna be the Arizona Diamondbacks. Obviously taking I thought the Diamondbacks had a, another good draft. But I did think that I did also think that there were some picks that kind of got a little bit overrated. Um, Jordan Lawler was a decent pick at number six. Um, obviously, I do have a video on my channel saying that Lawler is going to be the better player over Meyer. Um, some information has actually come out that has actually changed my opinion on that a little bit. I might make a video explaining what I saw in Lawler and in in, in Mayer and kind of going back with new information that I found out. But um Jordan Lawler doesn't particularly hit the ball hard or as hard as I thought he did hit it. So he didn't really have the best exit velocities. So obviously I think that like the power is gonna have to develop. Like, I don't know what the, the power potential here is. He's going to have to really hit if he's not going to hit a lot of home runs. He's going to have to really hit. I, I think he might have it in him. I think the defense is also solid. But I think at number six, it was a, it was a decent pick. I thought it was a decent pick at the time. But, you know, information does come out later. And then, like, from this point on, you kind of, like, you do buy into the depth of the college class. You get Ryan Bliss... Decent hitter from Auburn. You get um, Adrian Del Castillo, catch right in Miami, in the compensate in the in the competitive balance round. Really decent, really good player. Another, you kind of do just get a lot of decent players from from here on out. So the Diamondbacks had a decent draft. Again, it wasn't truly anything groundbreaking, but I thought it was a decent draft for what they really had to deal with. Obviously, getting Lawler at six, I think that obviously I don't think they were expecting Lawler at six, but he was probably their best player on their board, and they took them. And I can't fault a team for taking the best player, the best player on the board. I also can't fault a team for also taking 
for also buying into the depth of this class with the college hitters. So Jordan, so that's going to be it for the NL edition of this video. Come back next time and we're going to be talking about the AL edition of this video. So see you later guys and take care. Have a wonderful night and remember to like and subscribe to the channel. Thank you.